Okay. Rolling. Right. Welcome everyone to this special youth specialties interview. My name is Jacob Eckeberger. I'm the content manager at YS. And with me today, we have two very special people. First off, Mina Mara, who you probably recognize. He's one of our core YS bloggers, pastor, a longtime youth worker. And Mina had this crazy idea to try and sit down with Dr. Tim Keller, uh, who's an author, a theologian, uh, as well as a founding pastor of Redeemer Presbyterian Church in New York City. And I can't believe you said yes. I can't either. It's pretty amazing. Um, oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, and Mina, hmm. thank you for inviting us to along. No, thank this, you for being so. here. I I'm mean, glad to. Yeah. This is all a bet, so I'm well, going to you know, it out the works. It's well, Jacob just said, it's a special edition of Youth Specialties with special That's guests. True. So this is going to be a special, special time. time. Yeah. <laughs> it is. So uh, I, just, I didn't want to miss out on it. So that's why I said yes. <laughs> well, our, our audience probably knows a lot more about you than maybe you know a little bit about them. So okay. um, they've, uh, a lot of them have read a lot mm -hmm. of your books. They know you from the Gospel Coalition. Maybe mm -hmm. they know a little bit about, re yeah. Uh, maybe they know a little <laughs> bit about um, Redeemer's story. But I'm hoping that you can give us a little bit more of your journey and uh, how you came to plant Redeemer Presbyterian mm. Church. Well, my journey, let's see, I grew up in eastern Pennsylvania in a, I went to a little Lutheran church, just a traditional Lutheran church. Uh, went off to college uh, in the late 60s, wasn't um, uh, like most everybody else went to college in the late 60s, immediately said, I don't know if I'm a Christian. Mm. I, well, uh, Became a Christian through InterVarsity Christian Fellowship, wow. sure. yeah. um, and and so uh, felt hmm. changed by that, and so enjoyed ministry inside college, mm -hmm. ministering to other students. That I went immediately to seminary and got into, you know, ordained Presbyterian ministry. Hmm. I was a minister at the age of 24, so I was practically wow. a youth minister to myself. <laughs> I was my own youth minister because I was youth and I was a minister and so I ministered to myself. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, well, I could, yeah, well, you know, if you lose, you realize that you, you really need counseling if you lose the, the conversation, if you lose the debate. <laughs> so anyway, um, how I came to start Redeemer, though, it was, uh, I backed into it because mm -hmm. I was a, I did believe in starting new churches and cities. I was in Philadelphia. I was teaching at a uh, seminary there. I started to see how important it was to get churches in cities. I found, don't forget, now this is like a long time ago for most of you. Uh, <laughs> so like the mid 80s, when cities were kind of uh, not doing well and everybody mm -hmm. was leaving them, everybody. Mm -hmm. And I saw the need to have churches where people didn't want to live. Mm -hmm. wow. And also where there still are a lot of people. So I was, in general, supportive of it, and then somebody asked me to research uh, New York City as a place for a new church. Hmm. And I did it, and I kind of got stuck, because hmm. as I was trying to recruit somebody else to do it, and I couldn't find anybody, and after a while I started to get very convicted hmm. that, uh, well, why wasn't I willing to do it? I was scared, hmm. actually. Hmm. And my wife and I decided, well, if we couldn't find somebody else to do the job that we were trying to recruit somebody to do, we ought to go do it ourselves, otherwise we were hypocrites. Mm. And we couldn't find anybody, so we came. And that was mm. 1989. Wow. That's, wow. So that's, that's a nutshell. Yeah. And so over the years, tons have changed since then. Yeah, now cities largely are not places people don't want to live. Mm. Hmm. I mean, a lot of people don't, but I'm trying to say, sure. they're much more, cities have grown uh, lots of young people want to live in cities. It's yeah. radically different than it was 30 years ago. Sure. Mm. When I when I said let's go to cities, that's when nobody wanted to go to cities, and now <laughs> now so many go. young people want to be in cities. So now it looks like mm. it's a very it's very different. Yeah. That's what it means by change. Yes. Yeah. Um, and before we get into your questions, Mina, uh, I'm yeah. really curious. Not, not, we'll, we'll get to you eventually. <laughs> I'm sorry. Well, I'm going to go over here. <laughs> I mean, as youth workers, because I know that you and I share this similar Definitely. heartbeat. Um, as youth workers, I'm super curious to know a little bit about Redeemer's vision for mm. reaching teens and families of teenagers in New York City. Would you uh, mind sharing just a little bit? But only a little bit. And <laughs> the reason is I don't... <clears throat> uh, Manhattan is a very weird spot. Mm. And it's really not like most other cities. Mm. Okay. It is, um, it's, besides being very, very large, um, 
when I got here, and I think it's still the case, something like two-thirds of all people in uh, Manhattan, at least in our part of Manhattan, live mm -hmm. by themselves. Okay, yeah. Uh, it's highly single, highly, mm -hmm. it's really single. Uh, my own church, when Redeemer, when Redeemer had 1,200 people coming, we only had uh, six children in it. Wow. We only had, uh, we had very few married people. Mm. Uh, even today, with, uh, we are really unusual in that Redeemer has, uh, you know, between five and 6,000 people coming and two-thirds of them are single. Mm. And I've had a number of consultants tell me that there's no other large church like that. Mm. Now, in that situation, not only do you have fewer teenagers, you don't have that many teenagers here, um, as you might think, because you have so many single people without children. Mm. Um, but I have to tell you, at least in the early days, teenagers, you might say youth ministry kind of took care of itself. When my, <laughs> kids were, when my kids were teenagers, we didn't have a youth group. Mm. Um, what they did was, we, we, found that, we found that teenagers in churches do not believe they will ever be the age of their parents. Hmm. They don't believe wow. it. I mean, technically they do, but they don't. Sure, yeah. So when they look at parents, they can't identify with them. But what they do identify with is 23 to 25 year olds. Mm. Those are the kind of people they, they, they want to be like them. Mm. Now in the average evangelical church, those people aren't really there. Mm. You got teenagers, you got parents and grandparents, but that group is not there. But in the middle of big cities like Redeemer, Redeemer is mainly uh, at least certainly in the beginning, was almost completely nothing but 20-somethings. Mm. So when my kids got into adolescence, mm. they saw all these passionate Christians who were exactly the kind of people they wanted to be. Mm. Wow. Um, they saw, you know, bright young business people and actors and that sort of thing. And so they hung out, and that was, that was our youth group. We just basically had um, our, our teenagers hung out with uh, passionate, <coughs> young, single Christians, the kind of people they wanted to be, and, that, and, and the rest is history. We didn't need a youth group for a long, long, long time. Mm -hmm. And to some degree, we still don't. To some degree, it's just really different in, in, a, in a city or with a, a church like Redeemer. So I don't know that what I just said actually is of any use to anybody. <laughs> else because I don't know how transferable it is but sure, yeah. you asked yeah and so so it's your fault <laughs> I'll take it. that I just gave you a non-transferable and probably useless answer to your question it's very authentic though I, I gotta say it's, it's that's, that's what we yeah. did our kids I mean our kids are would would look back and say thank you uh, for uh, helping us have a vision for a kind of Christianity that got us excited mm. but it really wasn't through ministry per se targeted to them yeah. uh, they were just they were just caught up in the ministry as it was we do have a youth group we do have uh, we do have youth ministry but it's still a very big part of mm. how we do business here yeah. and that is the adolescents see the people out there that they want to be like wow. and that's not as true frankly in suburban ministry mm. yeah. where the single the young single people are gone they're they're in LA they're in New York they're in Seattle they're working for Amazon or, or Google or something like that. And they're, they're out of the more traditional suburban places. Mm -hmm. And the kids very often don't have people, they don't see other Christians that they want to be like. Wow. So anyway, that's just, I'm not sure that's what you came to talk to me about. No, but there it, it is. is. I think it's a, it's a great answer, to be honest okay. with you. And it's very special because we're here together during this, this special time. <laughs> um, and while we're here during this okay. special time, as we kind of segue into this, um, you've written a great book here, uh, Hidden Christmas. And I got to say, is this your shortest one so far? Well, it was the fastest one. <laughs> <laughs> Man, I, because I mean, base, I've, I'm a for, I've been in the ministry for 40 years. Mm -hmm. If you've been in the ministry for 40 years, you have had, you've done so many sermons and messages on Christmas. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so basically, I sat down with the texts, mm -hmm. you know, Luke, Matthew, and I just wrote out meditations on them as if I was about to preach on them. And the whole thing took, it's close to the, it might, I, I think it might be longer than Prodigal God. It might, be, it might not be the shortest, but it, it took me the least amount of time. 100, 145 pages. Yeah. I think this is the shortest one that I've investigated so far. Okay. Uh, but you're the author. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so I want to go with <clears throat> what yeah. you have to say. All but it's just, it was, it, was, it was simple, but mm. it's also, you know, I mean, I, it also, it came out pretty, pretty easily, and people still are interested in Christmas. Yeah, I got to tell you, it's a phenomenal book, and you don't, you know, miss any words. 
right from the jump start. Chapter one, here is what you have to say of your words here. One of the first indications of the Christmas season is the appearance of lights. Lights yeah. on trees, candles and windows, radiance everywhere. This this is appropriate because December twenty fifth mm -hmm. follows the darkest time of the year in the in the Mediterranean world and Europe. Yeah. Did not the know that by the, by the way. Mm. So I learned something by reading this here. Yeah. <laughs> How is the world dark, you ask? In the Bible, the word darkness refers to both evil and ignorance. Yeah. Look at what was happening at the time of the birth of Jesus. Violence, injustice, abuse of power, homelessness, refugees fleeing, oppression, families ripped apart, and bottomless grief. Sounds exactly like, like today. today. <laughs> How are we in this dark world supposed to be like? Well, the idea, <clears throat> the idea that in that message was um, that the message of Christmas is that, that the only hope we have in a dark world has to come from outside the human race. Yeah. That's the reason why the, the famous Christmas text is the people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Upon those living in the shadow of death, um, a light has dawned. And what I try to say there is, it doesn't say from, from those living in the, in, in the darkness, a light has sprung. It's upon those, hmm. a light has dawned. So the message of Christmas is, it, there's a lot of evil in the world, and we don't really know how to solve it. Yeah. Uh, psychology, sociology, hmm. public policy, that hasn't solved it. Hmm. And therefore, the hope comes from outside. Hmm. And... Um, that's the message of Christmas is that we actually aren't able to handle our own problems, that human beings yeah. will never be able to do it by themselves. And you have, to, you have to have faith, you have to have a relationship with God. It's about as simple a message as possible, mm -hmm. but it is a Christmas message. Yeah, you know, you've written a lot of great stuff, there's no doubt about it. Why a Christmas book? Well, <clears throat> we're, I don't believe our culture is ever going to be able to really kill Christmas. I mean, it can't. It has, it has to have <laughs> Christmas. Not, yeah. Because it, it has to, it, it, it's yeah. just crucial to the economy. So it's always gonna have to live with Christmas. Mm. And it'll be almost impossible to completely extinguish its roots. Mm. Mm. Uh, the imagery, the, 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 the songs, most of which are Christmas carols and things like that. I mean, you know, we're trying to create new ones like Holly Jolly Christmas and I Saw Mommy Kissing Santa Claus, <laughs> but they're still going to occasionally play Hark the Herald Angels Sing. Mm. And so that tells you about the roots. So in a way, uh, even in a culture getting more secular, at least once a year, the whole culture is haunted. Hmm. You know, Flannery O'Connor said the South was a Christ-haunted part of the country. Hmm. Even if people weren't Christians, it was haunted. Yeah. And that may not be as true as it used to be. You're yeah, from Atlanta, right? Not. That's nowhere near as Christ-haunted as yeah. it was. <laughs> but in a, sense, in a sense, Christmas is, is I, as far as I can see, indefinitely in the future, it's a time in which the entire culture will be haunted mm. by Christ. And so it's a time you mm. can talk about it. it. It does remind people of it. So it's just an, op it's an opportunity to talk about Christianity, I I'd, think. I'd have to agree. You know, in, in the book, the latter part of the book, in fact, you mentioned about youth ministry a little bit anywhere in it, where, where you yeah. say, you know, people may have grown up as, as a youth, in their youth days anyway, where they may have asked about, hey, about doubt or things they were wondering about, right. basically. Um, it's our youth workers who are dealing with students who do have, have doubt um, and who do have questions about their faith. What, would you, what advice would you give them on how to actually deal with that? Uh, it, it depends on the doubt. What do you mean? You mean like what kind the of question? Doubt when it comes to their faith. Oh, yeah, uh, yeah. When it comes yeah. to things of God. Well, the book of Jude, which nobody ever reads, it is in the Bible. Okay. In verse 22, it says, be merciful to them that doubt, hmm. which I think is a great verse. Wow. Isn't that interesting? It, is. it, it, um, it shows, uh, first of all, you shouldn't, the youth ministers, you need to not in any way even look at them cross-eyed when they express doubt. Hmm. Um, I have talked to a lot of secular people here who told me that when they expressed doubts in their youth group, their wow. youth leader basically said, well, what, why are you asking that? There was just a, there was all sorts of nonverbal ways of mm -hmm. communicating that this is not really acceptable. Wow. In the book, I mentioned the fact that when Gabriel tells Zechariah he's going to have a baby, mm -hmm. John the Baptist, and he expresses doubt, he's punished. Yeah. 
because he's, you can't speak until John's born. Mm. And when Gabriel says to Mary she's going to have a child, and she expresses doubt, mm. he just gives her more information. Mm. And so uh, she almost, almost expresses doubt the same way that, John, uh, that Zechariah does, but she's not punished for it. Mm. So what I gather from that is there really are f relatively sincere doubts where you're really, w you're really open to new ideas. Yeah. You really want to know. And there's a kind of doubt that basically is a way of trying to uh, keep the truth out and stay in control of your life. Mm. And so only God knows the heart. Mm. And it's your job as the youth minister to be merciful to those that doubt, to realize that doubt can probably lead to greater faith, especially if, you're, if mm. you cultivate it, to realize that sometimes doubts and questions are really stonewalling. Mm. Wow. And at that point, you do need to call, call them out, but you're not going to know that right away. Mm. So you can't tell whether it's a Zechariah doubt or a Mary doubt right off the bat. Sure. And wow. you need to be merciful and open, and, and as time goes on, you might have to call the person out and say, you know, I'm not, I'm not sure how honest these questions are. I think you don't want to believe, mm. and so you need to acknowledge that. Or to some other people say, let's keep talking because I think, it, you know, you're growing here. You know, that was part of the book that I thought was very interesting um, when you kind of laid out the two of them to, next yeah. to each other. And I had never seen it like that before. I mean, it was one of those deals I said, wow, that's the difference. Mm. And you wrote another book also during the mm. same season, Making Sense of God. Yeah. First time you've done two. A little two? longer. Uh, yeah, a yeah. lot longer. <coughs> no, The Hidden lot. Christmas was, I wrote after that one. Okay. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. Not exactly the same time. They just came out at the same time. Yeah, it was kind of like, that's it. It was just interesting how they both came out kind of around the, yeah. the same time anyway. Yeah. Um, Jake? And, well, I, I heard you describe the premise of Making Sense of God. Uh, as an explanation of why we need to be concerned about how people come to their beliefs, and yeah. really any belief. And when I think about myself as a youth worker and the youth workers that we are creating resources for and interacting with on a daily basis, um, there are so many elements of that that I think they um, will love. And, mm -hmm. uh, and so I would, I would appreciate it if you can maybe tease that out a little bit more and explain that premise a little bit further for anyone who hasn't, who hasn't picked it up. Well, I don't, yeah, a little bit, sure. sure. Wh what I'm trying to say there is that uh, uh, people tend to not, their beliefs aren't actually visible to them. Mm -hmm. In fact, even their doubts very often are based on beliefs that they're not questioning at the moment. Mm -hmm. wow. And so I think it's, the, uh, what I want to do, I think we should do, is especially for young people, we need to help them uh, make their beliefs visible to them as beliefs. Sure. So, for example, it would be very typical for a young person today to say, well, you know, you have to be true to yourself. Yeah. I mean, they're going to get that. <laughs> Why? Okay. Now, where'd they get that? They get it from everywhere, but okay. So, it, in a very non-threatening way, you say, that's an interesting belief. Why, why should I believe that? Hmm. Why, why should I believe that? I mean, um, maybe you believe that. That's great, but why should I? Hmm. Now, that's a better way. It, you're not questioning their belief at the moment. Sure. You're not saying, well, why do you think that? No. Sure. It would be better to say, well, I see you believe that, but wh why would you, uh, how, how would, I don't know that I do, why should I believe that? Mm. The, immediately, usually the person will say, well, what do you mean? Mm. Uh, because they don't see it as a belief. Mm. They see it as a self-evident uh, fact about the way things are. Mm. Now, an older person knows that there's, most people in the world don't see it that way. Mm. Um, if you're in China and uh, you're growing up and you're, you, you say to your parents, you've got to be true to yourself, your parents will say, no, you don't. You have to be true to your family. Mm. I said, where did you get that? Mm. And uh, so, I mean, there's all sorts of ways. Uh, th they need to be shown that those things are beliefs. Mm. They're based on particular understandings of human nature, human destiny, human purpose. Uh, even by just asking them to make a case for it shows them it's a belief and they'll, they'll probably be at a loss. Mm. And it just helps them see mm. that they probably didn't actually think that out as a belief. They just picked it up because it was, you know, it comes through social media, it comes through, it's the message of a lot of movies and TV shows. Mm. And, and if you get a chance, now this is another question, but yeah. what I try to show in the book is that that actually doesn't work mm. as a belief. It's mm. incoherent. Sure. So, uh, and, and at a certain point you need to explain that to them. That way they can see that this is a belief and some people have it, but it's not necessarily self-evident. Hmm. 
And, and another mm. aspect of the book, you talk about how it's possible for Christianity to still make sense yeah. today. And, um, and so could you, could you share a little bit um, of, uh, I mean, this is giving us a glimpse into more of the book, but more of those connection points between what our youth workers, as they're trying to help millennials and teenagers today find and follow Jesus, yeah. some of the connecting points between those thoughts in the book and what yeah. they face every day. Well, the middle part of the book, by the way, I would never suggest sh giving making sense of God to a to a teenager. By the way, never. Sure. Mm. I wouldn't. Okay. No, I think I think it'd be too hard. Mm. It's it's too academic. Sure. It would certainly be for a college graduate or something. Like that. But anyway, <clears throat> but the middle part isolates these six: um, meaning, satisfaction, freedom, identity, justice, and hope. Mm. And I say, nobody can live life without um, these, those things. Hmm. You've got to have meaning in life. You've got to have a satisfying life. You need to be free. You need to have a stable identity. You have a basis for understanding what is right and wrong, justice, mm -hmm. and hope. And I say, arguably, the, the secular world is going to give you a way of getting those mm -hmm. things. Mm -hmm. Christianity is going to get a, give you a way of getting those things. I'd like to show you that Christianity gives you better resources. Hmm than the secular world does. Wow. Hmm. And that would be my, for, I think for most youth, that's real apologetics. Yeah. Hmm. It's not the evidence for the resurrection, it's, it's right there. Hmm. And so what I would do is, this is a nutshell inside the book, I would say that the secular world gives you, you it says you can create your own meaning, hmm. but Christianity gives you a meaning that suffering can't take away from you, hmm. and you will suffer. Secular meaning, suffering takes it away. Christianity, it actually makes your meaning in life stronger. Mm -hmm. um, the secular world will say, it, it, you have to go find your own satisfaction, but it's based on circumstances. Christianity can give you a, uh, a satisfaction that's not just based on circumstances. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Christianity, I mean, the secular world will say, uh, assert your desires. If you mm -hmm. desire something, assert it. Yeah. Christianity, following St. Augustine, would say, no, you have to reorder your desires. Hmm. That is to say, you have to make sure you're, you're, you're desiring the most important things first and the less important things less and so forth. Hmm. Uh, freedom, the way the uh, secular culture identifies freedom is as complete lack of limitations on all of your options, which destroys the ability to have a love relationship. Christianity defines freedom in such a way that it doesn't destroy love, but it actually enriches it, hmm. and so on. So what you do... Listen, what I just did there, if that sounds unfamiliar to you, if you're a youth worker, you need to know, in a nutshell, those six things, mm. what, how Christianity gives them to you, how the secular world gives, you, gives, gives them to you, and you'd be able to compare them. Because yeah. that's the way kids are going to start to find Christianity makes sense to them. Mm. Because it's going to have to make emotional and cultural sense before it makes rational sense. Mm. Mm -hmm. Before you can sit down and say, here's why there is a God, and here's why the, there's evidence for the resurrection. See, to me, that's real apologetics. Yeah. Wow. What led you to that point? Because when I hear you talk and I go, wow, that's good. What got you here? Um, because I did the more traditional apologetics where you talked about um, the, um, you know, how do you know there's a God? Mm. How do you know the Bible's true? Mm. Um, how do you know you can trust the Gospels? How do you know you can that Jesus was really God? How do you know that he was raised from the dead? Those are mm -hmm. traditional apologetics. Sure. I found that though that helped a lot of people, the people that it helped were people who already wanted Christianity to be true. Mm. So if That's, you wanted it to be true, yeah. then um, I knew how to help them find it was. Yeah. But what about most of the people and a growing number of people who don't care mm. because they can't imagine it would be relevant to them? Mm. So, uh -huh. um, uh, I began to realize that that's a group of people that I didn't, I wasn't speaking to. Hmm. Why would you even want it to be true? Um, mm -hmm. And so you want to be able to say, look, this isn't proving it's true, but let me just tell you what Christianity offers. Mm -hmm. And if at the end of the presentation they say, wow, that's great, but how do I know it's true? Right. Chapter two. <laughs> but see, chapter, I had left out chapter one. So I did chapter two before I got to chapter one. I realized I was leaving people out. That's, that's why. Oh, that's huge. That's huge. That's a, a, that's a big, big help mm -hmm. to a lot of youth workers. 
and youth pastors. Okay. Um, I, I got to just speak for them. And I got to say this as well. I did a little poll. I call it the minor poll here. <laughs> and you have a huge following amongst our audience when it comes to the millennial generation. At my age? Yes. Yeah, um, yeah I was yeah. surprised too. Just um. <laughs> If I wasn't so old, just think of how big I'd be with them. I know, I know. I know, it's astounding. <laughs> You'd be like huge. I'd be, I'm enormous, man. But no. I don't. could have been a contender. <laughs> Never mind, go ahead. <laughs> I could go on off that little trail of not. Uh, no, a lot of our audience members lo love you a lot. They love your work. And I, and I got to be honest. I mean, I followed you. But I thought millennials really get what you're saying. And the thing that I hear over and over and over again is, I cannot tell you, Mina, how many times he's helped me pull together a Bible study when it comes to what you just said. I'm just glad to help. No, it's I a mean, hard, this is hard work. It is. The ministry, to especially younger people, is hard work. Yeah, well, why do you think it's hard work? I gotta ask that question. Well, because, uh, because they are, the, the, um, look, the, those, I'll call them narratives. Hmm. You know, I mentioned, here, here's one. Uh, you got to be true to yourself. Hmm. Okay. Uh, here's another one. You got to do what makes you happy. Hmm. You just have to. Okay. Here's another one. That is, uh, nobody has the right to tell anybody else how to live their life. Hmm. Hmm. Now, these are narratives. Yeah. Okay. They, comp they are, uh, nobody ever tried to convince them of them. In other words, it wasn't a classroom with bullet points. It comes through the music, it comes through the stories, it comes through social media. It just bombards you as this is the way it is. Mm -hmm. And it completely undermines uh, everything the Bible teaches about discipleship, which is you lose yourself to find yourself. Mm -hmm. You lose your life to find yourself. You take up your cross and follow me. He who wants to save his life will lose his life. That's ex exactly, <laughs> it, you know, when, when, when the, listen, when the Amish, by the way, when the Amish, um, uh, when that guy, over 10 years ago now it was, uh, took a bunch of little yeah. Amish school kids hostage, mm. killed a bunch of them, then shot himself. And the Amish community came around the family of the shooter and forgave them. That was amazing. And everybody said, oh, this is how we ought to be. Well, there was three sociologists from that part of the country wrote a book called Amish Grace, and they said, our culture cannot produce what the Amish did mm. because our culture teaches self-assertion Self-assertion will always respond to aggression with more aggression. Wow. We are teaching people you do not self-deny, you do not do self-renunciation, wow. ever. And so all the cultural narratives are away from being able to do what the Amish did hmm. and away from discipleship. And the kids are just steeped in them. Hmm. And so you're fighting it. Hmm. You have them, what, one hour a week or you have them a couple hours a week or something like yeah, that. Couple. And they have, you know, almost, almost, you know, they're just, bathed in it all the time. So you're, that's why I'm saying it's harder than it's ever been to minister to you. Yeah, I, I would agree with you. They love you once again. And so here's you the- You keep saying that. They do. <laughs> no, I, I've, I've got to keep saying that because over and over again, that's what I got. And in fact, on my way here, they all, they all said, man, this is just phenomenal. So here's the last question here. Our youth worker audience is largely made up of millennials yeah. um, who seem to really be drawn to your books and your ministry. What advice would you give to the millennial youth workers and pastors today? I think I may have given almost everything. <laughs> I, I, you gave a lot of good stuff. Your questions are, have been very good, and I think most of the advice has already been drawn out of me. Um, I think I, if they feel like it's never been harder to do what we're doing, that 20 years ago was easier and it's harder today to minister to youth than it's ever been, I would actually have to say your self-pity is warranted. Mm -hmm. It probably is harder <laughs> than it's ever been, <laughs> at least in Western history, mm -hmm. because the kids are, uh, are much more saturated in narratives that are really antithetical to the basic narratives of the Bible. Mm -hmm. uh, so you, but when I say self-pity, I'm doing it with a tongue in cheek because uh, frankly, in the history of the world, uh, when, the, when the monks, set out to go up into pagan Europe, you know, in 400 A.D., 500 A.D. Uh, they did win Europe, and a lot of them got killed. Mm -hmm. So we, we shouldn't have too much self-pity. The fact is, though, you've got a really, really uh, hard road to hoe, but there's, there's always hope, because mm -hmm. God always breaks through, and uh, we just have to be faithful. Thank mm -hmm. you. Well, if you haven't picked up 
Hidden Christmas or Making Sense of God yet? Uh, we'll give you an opportunity to do that in the links right below this video, so make sure that you don't miss out. And thank you all for joining us.